I was so glad of the way the turn things took last night because it made a completely different presentation for tonight. Somebody at Viv's this morning said, uh, well, now we'll never know what you were going to say. That isn't the point. The point is this class was designed with the idea of making Holy Week pertinent to the individual. And unless we're taking care of the concerns that you have, it isn't going to be the least bit pertinent to the individual. Uh, are you getting that hum over there, Fred? Because I can hear something somehow. Great, great. <coughs> so, it, what Vern said was, the way I would paraphrase it, and probably not totally the way he intended it, but just to give it an edge, uh, apparently 2,000 years of Christianity as practiced hasn't made a dent in all the old evils. Was that something akin? I wouldn't deny that at all. If we can underscore as practiced. Because it's been practiced as a ritual, largely and widely. So take this down if you're taking notes. There's no need to, but if you are. We're talking about the 13th chapter of Mark. It will be very familiar to you. And he went out of the temple. Oh, it's as he went out of the temple. One of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Ah, how great. See what we've accomplished in the world of materiality. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. Any manifestation deceive you into believing that it is objective to your perception of it. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled. Now does that seem to be indicating be heartless, be hard-hearted? Not so. When ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Just the beginnings. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before the rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. Who's talking? Your inner spirit. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, and then in parenthesis, very pointedly, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein, to take anything out of his house. You'll know from that whether or not you've awakened at all. If you're capable, when this thing happens, when you shall see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. The word Judea means the country. If you find yourself in the country, go to the mountains. Well, what are these mountains? They're these altitudes of perception, these altitudes of recognition. These are the mountains. And then when you're on the housetops, go not down into the house, neither enter therein, 
to take anything out of that house. What do you want to haul around the old identifications for when you've become awake? Look in, keep looking in, and the end of the world comes that way. Now, we've got a stack of them to prove it. Uh, we're now in the 25th chapter of Isaiah. I've simply put down verses 1 and 7 to 12. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Speaking of this Lord. He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. How is the veil spread over all nations except the view I have of them? That's the veil. So he's going to destroy in this mountain, nowhere else, but in this mountain, the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord hath spoken it. You see, if, that's, if the world is still to you an objective thing, it looks as if, if we worked hard enough at this, that would happen literally, universally. The end of the world comes to the individual in his awakening, where he ceases to see it as an objective reality. He sees it as an indication of where he's standing in the awakening process. Uh, and it shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. And Moab, and that's the incestuous son of Lot, Moab shall be trodden down under him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them, as he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. And the, their fortress of the high fort of their walls shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. See, it's the same old thing that we were talking about in the New Testament. That eventually, eventually, all of these things, as we rise, we see the dust nature of state. They're nothing. They're conceivable, but have no identity. They have no life in them, animating them, unless I supply them with mine. Going on now to the, to the eighth chapter of Romans. And this is the crux of the whole thing. The sixth verse. For to be carnally minded is dead, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So how are we going then to escape the effects of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all of the famines and pestilence and the negatives that our world experience just by not being carnally minded? Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Isn't it natural? If you seek God, he's finding you. Do you ever lie over the edge of a swimming pool if the water is really still and you look down and you see another you looking up at you. Narrow the distance between you and the image of you. He gets closer and closer. Your nose hits the water and the illusion is broken. There aren't two of you at all. What you saw was what you believe yourself to be. You have a recognition of yourself and it approaches you as you approach it. The whole world will appear to approach us as we approach it. But if we understand and carry that understanding in our approach, what we're seeing will be the registration of what we are now understanding. Going on to 
the fifth chapter of 1 John, the first letter of John, and these are verses 11 and 20. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. It isn't out there in any foolish play or any wise play. The life is in his Son. His Son is his presence, I hasten to make clear. Not his issue, but his presence. We'll get a little later in the week to that thing from uh, Isaiah again, I believe, where it says, There is one alone. He hath neither child nor brother. That's the I am of you. So this life that he has given us is in his presence. Nowhere else. And we know that the Son of God is come. Well, if I'm here and I am conscious, then the presence of consciousness has come, hasn't it? We know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Oh, yes, this is. This, oh, here's, how, here's the Old Testament. Uh, I, I was staggered there for a second. It's the Old Testament uh, example of this deliverance, the marvelous deliverance of the children of Israel out of Egypt, which is the ignorance of the, of the uh, divinity. <laughs> There's a marvelous story about it. This woman was in a in a uh, museum and she was standing in front of a, an enormous blank canvas that covered the wall it was an elegant frame but the canvas hadn't a drop of paint on it and she looked at the little tag that identified it and it said the children of Israel passing through the Red Sea so she was so mystified she called over the guard and she said I don't under understand this at all would you explain it to me he said yes madam it is the children of Israel passing through the Red Sea she said I can see that by the tag but I asked you to explain it she said uh, where is the Red Sea well he said it is rolled back well where are the children of Israel <laughs> they've gone on <laughs> and Pharaoh and his house they haven't got there yet <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, this is the this is the uh, account of it that the lady, yes. Does that imply where we are? Oh, not yet. <laughs> not yet. As I say, the the Old Testament is a blueprint of what must be. The New Testament tells you how it happens. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. Say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Okay, God spake unto Moses. Moses, the capacity to lead, this which marshals the thinking, gets it ordered and established. Okay, he says, I am the Lord, says to Moses. And then goes on and says, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Well, now when you're saying it, that's going to sound as if you're claiming to be God. It isn't it's God claiming to be Moses. It's the same thing, but it's a little more, has a little more punch when you have omnipotence claiming to be me than me claiming to be Moses. I mean, claiming to be omnipotence. Say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. I mean, who wants to walk right straight through the battlefield? Who wants to see the 
the, the giants lick the pygmies. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt, still pretty much in bondage. They're harnessed. But the Egyptians pursued after them, naturally, if they're still harnessed, all their horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them in camping by the sea. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, that is the extended understanding, over this turbulence of unorganized thought. <coughs> and the Lord God caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. See, when you've got them divided, when you've given them some arrangement, you can go through on dry ground, and there'll be a wall to you on your right hand and your left. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea. The very same action that divided it brought it back together. Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. When the morning appeared, when the dawn was up. And the Egyptians fled against it. In other words, the ignorance of my divinity is naturally going to flee that. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. They are helpless states. This ignorance of my divinity is a helpless, helpless condition. And if I can see it and all that they represent dead on the seashore, they're not going to pursue me anymore forever, he says. So, getting to what Vern said last night when he was concerned about would he have any homework to do, he said what, what it was a serious question he had. Uh, he wanted to know what the subject was going to be tonight, what we were going to take up. Well, what we're going to take up is the river that flows out of Eden. Here you are in this great garden of paradise, and the river flows out, <clears throat> this river of water of life flows out. It says, and the river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. <coughs> and I consider that to be spiritual, moral, mental, and physical. In other words, consciousness flows out. If it isn't conscious of itself as something, it would be very static. It wouldn't be conscious, would it? The fact that it is consciousness implies that it's conscious of something. And since it's all there is, it has to be conscious of itself. But that being conscious of itself is an outflowing. And it will always be in four heads. You are spiritual as you are. That is your being. You are moral in the way you behave the moral concerns behavior. You're mental in what you understand, and you're physical in the way you appear. You know, you, you, you've read that, and I do, I'm sure. There are the four levels laid out in a diagram, and you, uh, you know, you asked me what, are the, what would be the things I would change. One of the things that I had them change when the first corrections were made, they had a bar across the top. I wanted only four. 
In other words, I wanted the literal, physical appearance to stand revealed. They've got another lid on it. That's another thing I would remove if I were doing it. You know, if you're looking at that uh, diagram, if you could hold it in a sense like this instead of the arrows going up and down, if you could see them as going in and out, you'd have a better sense of it, I think. Every diagram has its limitations because you're having to use these terms. But it's causative where it's spiritual and you're dealing with convictions. The rest is all interpretation. There's nothing causative anywhere else. Let us start from the literal, where everything is physical in appearance. That's clear enough to anyone. Run the arrow in a little bit. If you've analyzed the appearance at all, you may have found something distressing. You can reduce the appearance to a concept of which it is the appearance. Now that concept is purely mental and it's psychological interpreting as the appearance was purely physical and was literal interpreting. Well, it's perfectly wonderful then on that mental level to find a concept that is the exact opposite of the one that was out picturing in a distressing fashion. But when you have found the opposite, you can rearrange that but don't expect that to do anything. When you've simply changed one concept for another, that's only uh, putting a different slide in your projector. You still have to have some light and some juice. Okay. When the new concept is deep enough with you that it influences your behavior, stirs up a little sensation of its reality, you've come away, but that hasn't done anything creative. These are still interpretive. When you can deepen that to a conviction of actually being it, you've got it. And in, on page 53 of the same book, that middle paragraph, it says, while the being remains eternally one, each of its four quarters fulfills a distinct function as an available interpretation level for the individual at whatever degree he slumbers or wakes. Available at whatever degree he slumbers or wakes. We're not going to slough off one in favor of another and then another. The city lieth four square. Any idea that is spiritually felt as a conviction is morally impressed as an emotional sensation, psychologically understood as a mental concept, and literally evidenced as a physical appearance. That's simply a scaled, a terribly scaled down explanation of how we do it. We'll go into that in greater detail. I think, yeah, I was, I was questioning whether to do this now. I think we will. The, if we can make sure that when you see that, that when that's reached the outer, literal interpreting, this is where you're confronted with this, what we call this body. Some will say this vile body because St. Paul speaks of it as a vile body. Well, the only thing vile about it is a concept one has of it. There's nothing vile about it at all. But while we're speaking of that, let us um, take this from John, the fifth chapter of John. Start right here. Now there is at Jerusalem, right at Jerusalem, this dwelling place of God, there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And the word translated Bethesda means house or dwelling. In other words, this body in which we appear to dwell, having five porches, five senses, outlets or inlets of information. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, states, I say, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. 
These angels that are thoughts, messages, divine impressions, they come to us at a certain period and they certainly do trouble the water. And whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And this is quite true. If you're at Jerusalem, the dwelling place of creativity, and you have this sense of yourself as this body, and then the message comes of something by way of enlightenment, that has troubled the water. And the sooner you step into that new sense, you can see why they gathered. Whoever first stepped in was made whole of whatever plague he had. All right, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. 3 and 8 is 11. 1 and 1 is 2. That's the way the numerologists will do it. And this is the sense of duality. That's an infirmity, if ever there was one. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Then the impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man, when the water is troubled, to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. That ought to speak plainly enough about depending on otherness, somebody outside myself, something outside myself, any agency outside the self of me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Your own I amness will say, Ascend to be just that. Think of yourself from this standpoint of being just that. And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked. And on that same day was the Sabbath. That's the day when you rest in what you now have understood. Any question on that before we proceed? Okay. Then I want to take William Blake... If you have the complete Blake, what I'm reading from is The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, and it's plate 14, the complete plate. If you have the complete Blake, it's on page 154. The ancient tradition that the world will be consumed in fire at the end of 6,000 years is true, as I have heard from hell. For the cherub with his flaming sword is hereby commanded to leave his guard at Tree of Life, and when he does, the whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy, whereas it now appears finite and corrupt. This will come to pass by an improvement of sensual enjoyment. Not a denial of it, or an orgiastic indulgence in it, but an improvement of it. But first, the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged. This I shall do by printing in the infernal method, by corrosives, which in hell are salutary and medicinal, melting apparent surfaces away and displaying the infinite, which was hid. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Now, incidentally, Blake did develop that process of uh, acid eating away the uh, copper and uh, made such exquisite lithographs that they would sell for outrageous. He couldn't sell them in his time. But today they would bring such fortunes beyond the staggering of the imagination. Um, First, the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged. I was mentioning this to Viv a little bit earlier tonight about the concept that anyone carries of having a body that carries him. Like my vehicle. My vehicle, which has uh, let me down a time or two or three or four. (laughs) If I think I have a body that does that for my soul, no wonder it's failing me from time to time. If I can see that my body is my soul misinterpreted, 
than I can by rectifying that interpretation have a better sense of who I am, what I am, what my purpose is. And when I maintain that, I can't avoid becoming less and less conscious of that as a vehicle. And I will see those improved changes registered there because what is there? My identification, not my vehicle as a separate thing. So this is what he means. If the doors of perception were cleansed, we would see it as it truly is, not vile, not anything other than the embodiment of ideas that consciousness is containing or maintaining about itself. And it can't have a thing in itself but what it's made of. It's so easy, once you see that distinction, it's perfectly possible to hypnotize yourself into believing that you're something else and that something else will appear to you to be the thing. All the while, the one who's believing that is the same as he's always been. It's just a different arrangement, a different arrangement of the I. If I will simply see that the body I'm talking about is the embodiment of ideas and then gorge on those features that constitute this embodiment or are, are included in this embodiment, then bit by bit I will see how they relate. The, uh, to cleanse the doors of perception, you have to think of the five senses being the, uh, these, these five porches, as it says in the uh, reference we had from John. The five senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. These are the chief inlets, Blake says. Well, after all, that's the way we appreciate, but if I had not any consciousness of it, would I be appreciating it? I'm conscious of the perfume, or it means nothing to me. I'm conscious of the texture, or it means nothing to me. I'm conscious of the music, or it means nothing to me. I'm conscious of the sunset, or it means nothing to me. It might be there, but I don't... I know, I have ridden with people down Highway 1 who chatted like magpies and saw not one thing. It was there for the, to be seen, but not apparently in that stage of awakening or failure to. I wanted to take this from Blake because it's the perfect answer to that. And this is from the vision of the last judgment. And it's on page 617. He says, I question not my corporeal or vegetative eye any more than I would question a window concerning a sight. I look through it and not with it. Then, if you're afflicted with eye trouble, and I must say, you must have noticed that for the last two days I've done nothing but stand and wipe the Yosemite Falls that's pouring out of this. What have you got in your air here in Los Gatos? <laughs> I don't have it when I'm inside <laughs> much. Outside, it's... Uh, fiendish. I'm not, it's not outside of me, outside the door, outside the inmost privacy of me, for sure as sure there's something that's building its height. And I'm not blaming your climate really, that was just a joke. In fact, hasn't it been ideal? How could it have been nicer? Better not praise it too highly. <laughs> hmm? Monsoon. Right. This gets back to it, to this sense of any externality, as though it were a thing independent from my perception of it. He says, I assert for myself that I do not behold the outward creation, that to me it is hindrance and not action. It is the dirt upon my feet, no part of me. What, it will be questioned, when the sun rises, do you not see a round disk of fire somewhat like a guinea? Oh, no, no, I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
And from a certain standpoint, you can see why his contemporaries did call Blake crazy. In fact, in response to that very statement, that that's what I see when I see the sun, I don't see a red disk of fire about the size of a guinea. And they said to him, there is no hallelujah chorus 90 million miles out there in space. He said, neither is there a guinea. It's whatever the enlarged and numerous senses can perceive. So if what they can perceive is the political scene and the wars and the rumors of wars, it's understandable that we would say Christianity as practiced hasn't made much of a dent in the troubles. But where is it practiced if it's true Christianity? Blake says, he who waits to be perfect shall never enter the body of Christ. You've got to start believing that that is your body and then live it. Then it has got to appear around you. There's no other way. So if we purify the senses and do it that way, how, aren't we going to do it the same way with all the other organs of the body? Since the body to us is the embodiment of organs that function if I know the functions of consciousness, I certainly see how that relates and how it appears. May I take one more reference to this? And this is Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. I love it. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. And that comes as a relief. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, an heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. And you don't have to be a soothsayer to figure out that those six things are negations, I mean those seven things are negations of the seven elements or the seven days of creation. They are an abomination, a proud look. We've all heard of this, the pride of the intellect. That's the cardinal sin, the pride of the intellect. <coughs> Remember when we were speaking of intelligence being a feature and then brilliance and stupidity, simply opposite poles, which are nothing but states, but negation of this which actually is. Well. It's awfully easy to stumble into that thing and have a great pride of being intellectual instead of stupid. I'm not going to keep saying I think you think I'm dinging that end towards you and I'm not. No, it's just a, it's a horizontal swing. The pride of intellect is a proud look. In other words, it's a negation of the proper use of mind of its intelligence. A lying tongue, that which will not sustain, you cannot sustain a lie. It's bound to be found out. So this is a negation of spirit, which does sustain, which is substantial, which is the substance of all. Hands that shed innocent blood. When we've spoken of soul as being misinterpreted as a body, Soul is the identity. Then hands that would shed innocent blood are killing identity. This is, an in, this is a negation of the proper understanding of soul. And heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, <coughs> wicked imaginations, where there is no control. I'm thinking in terms of what you were bringing up last night, the things that are going on in the world, like the terrorism, that's the heart that deviseth <coughs> wicked imaginations. In other words, it is a negation of principle, where there is law. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. Isn't that life, the active thing? Only it's definitely in reverse. A false witness that speaketh lies. Isn't this truth? And he that soweth discord among brethren, so that brotherly love, 
is not possible to be maintained. In other words, it's love misused. You see, it's the constant recurrence of these in this order throughout scripture that make me see that principle is the fulcrum of the, in the seven. I know you asked that last night. Uh, I'm not so determined that I say that it can't be any other way. It's just that more and more research seems to confirm it. So then, if you know these elements of your being, you can ferret out what their features are, those that relate most closely to them. Mind, you've got intelligence, you have percipience, you have imagination, you have reason, you have logic, you have wisdom, did I mention that? I hope so, because it's <laughs> paramount. These are features that make mind recognizable as mind. And it isn't that they're not available in all the others, it's just that that's where they have more relevance. Well, all right, spirit. Spirit is the, the substance of, the essence. It is the reality, the uh, tangibility of it. By that I don't mean that you can dig it apart literally. I simply mean it's the thing that lasts. So, this which embodies, well, what does it embody but variety, significance, it's uh, all of its features. You, I know some of you have those sheets that I put out at one time. They were probably in a different order at that time. It doesn't really matter. They're, we're not... <laughs> we would need a trash compactor <laughs> instead of a word processor if we got into it in that sense. But uh, soul, individuality, in all-inclusiveness, distinction, diversity. You see, these are all features of soul. Then principle, this is where you find law and uh, balance, control, direction, exactitude. Life is where you have animation and vitality, uh, continuity, perpetuity. You see the general tenor, <coughs> features that make life recognizable as life. Truth, well, what it does, it, uh, what its features are, are dominion. You shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free, free from the ignorance, certainly. So that brings you dominion, freedom, um, peace, certainty, etc. Love, brings fulfillment, satisfaction, completeness, wholeness, joy, bliss, ad infinitum. So those are the things you're looking for. Those are the things you feed upon on the tree of life. Now, to see them as just abstractions, is nothing. I mean, it is, it's wonderful to have them. You really have to have them. But unless they're functioning, flowing out, like the river flowing out of Eden, irrigating the, the uh, land, nothing grows. So then you have to think in terms of their functions, features and functions. So you don't have to, do a, you don't have to go through all that rigmarole again. If you have the features, you know how they function. After all, the function of intelligence is to think. The, uh, it under, intelligence knows, it understands, it reasons, it analyzes. What does spirit do? It constitutes. It's the, if it's the substance of it, it constitutes its reality. And it uh, supports, it sustains, it maintains, it furnishes, it underlies, this is spirit. And soul, 
identifies, diversifies, embraces, embodies, and so forth. Principle establishes. Principle directs. It governs. It enforces. It disciplines. You remember you were speaking last night about the importance of discipline? Well, that's, that's where it comes from, in that one, from that one uh, element. It's, if we speak of a thoroughly unprincipled person, it's really a person that's never known discipline. It's a good example of it. So what does life do? It activates, it animates, it stimulates, it perpetuates, it continues. Love reaches, it attains, it fulfills, it en enlivens, it supplies, it rewards, it finishes, it expands, it extends. By finishes, I don't mean uh, cuts off. I simply mean it sees sees things through. Okay. Is that your body? You have seen a word picture then of your body. Consciousness embodying these features and these functions. Then if there's something wrong with something, it's easier to trace it, isn't it? And go back in, look in, <coughs> take that feature and s function it. Find it functioning. If you have stomach trouble, you have to ask yourself, what's the function of the stomach? It is to digest. Well, what is it among the seven elements that digests? But mind digesting its ideas. It thinks about, it contemplates, it comprehends until it's no longer just a concept but a conviction. That's digestion. And that would really correct digestive disturbances if we, if we would do that and then stop looking out. What's the function of the liver? It's to purify the blood of the impurities it's collected circulating through the system. Well, one of the features of spirit is purity. So that function of purification is what I'm calling a physical liver. And if I've got some liver abuse, then I should pick it up right there and start acknowledging. If my house is to be called a house of prayer, then I have to start acknowledging this as it truly is. And then if it's functioning, if it's flowing out in that feeling of actually being it, you've cleansed it. That's the end of the problem. So then the lungs. The function is inspiration. You breathe in, you breathe out. You breathe in, you breathe out. You inhale, you exhale. That is the procedure of inspiration. Well, soul will inspire. It embodies inspiration. Then I ought to take it and let that be its function and see it wipe away the discordant sense. And we don't have to go through all of these one by one, except that I do want to get to principle because of why you feel it hangs in the middle. We said last night, we're looking at this skeleton on which the flesh hangs. The skeleton, any network, a framework, the, uh, the nerves, the muscles, these are a network which certainly seem to be the core Without the frame, it wouldn't stand and operate, would it? So if there's anything wrong with any of those, uh, those uh, as we say, the nerves, the muscles, if you have bone disorders, find principle in you, the principle of you, and start experiencing its features so that they are actually functioning in you, and that cleanses the malfunction. Life, we should go the other way. Blood is what they call the life's blood. Blood is the vital fluid. Then it's clear enough to see that that is, if we're finding its source, its reality, we're finding life. And then if we will let it live and 
let its features function. That will purify the blood or do any, correct any imbalance of the red and white content. Then, of course, the process of elimination is necessary to the function of a body. So all of those, uh, what do we call them, ingredients, uh, that isn't the right word, but uh, the bowels, the kidneys, the bladder, the pores, these things which do the eliminating. What is it in my sevenfold nature that eliminates? It's truth that eliminates the misconceptions about itself. And if I understand that I am all of these, every single one of them is functioning in me, then that should correct any malfunction. <coughs> then the heart, which is the engine behind the workings, <coughs> that's love. They say love makes the world go round. I know a woman that had no sense of love whatever, but she says, well, money was made round to go round. My mother told me that. <laughs> Her world was money. It is really love that makes the world go round. <coughs> so you have to see any malfunction is appearing to the understander. And when the understander corrects his sense of that functioning, then that functioning is literally going to register his corrected sense. The rectification is going to show. And that understanding is not intellectual. Somebody said that uh, this morning at this session, that, uh, it, and I was thinking, you can't help but parallel it with Mary Baker Eddy. She said, this understanding is not intellectual. It is not the result of scholarly attainments. It is the reality of all things brought to light. That's exactly it. It isn't that you're making anything different. You're not making anything new. You're seeing it as it truly is, and that disabuses your mind of the way you had seen it. That's the healing process, not changing something. And the effort of so many to take a spiritual idea and sop it onto a physical body and then look and see what kind of effect it has constituted is just getting nowhere. Because the conviction is what I am is a physical body and I am appealing to something to do something to it, but this is what I am and damn it, I'd better have a healing. It doesn't change a thing. Because my conviction that that's what I am is what has to be changed. Nothing else. Now, let's, uh, let's have questions. You see, Jenny, you did me a great favor last night because you, you made me realize that I didn't have to cram all that into 40 minutes. Yes? When you discuss the, discussing the levels, the physical level and the mental level, Yes. if I heard you correctly, you said that the concept that the mental level would be the opposite of the physical appearance. No. It'll be the identical, it'll be what underlies the physical appearance. In other words, uh, whatever is physically appearing has a related, a corresponding mental concept. Mm -hmm. Now, if what is physically appearing is disturbing me, I can probe and find that concept that it's illustrating. And then finding that to be negative, I can exchange it for an affirmative concept. And then when I deepen that concept to a, to a behavioral level where I exercise it, and then deepen that to a conviction, I've done what I have to do. When I have the conviction, it's going to be behave logically. I'm going to behave that way naturally. And I'm going to understand it this way now instead of the old way and I'm going to physically evidence it this way now, instead of the old way. So every physical appearance, I think what I meant to say, and I may have said it wrongly, but what I meant to say was every physical appearance has a correlated uh, mental concept. What's appearing 
is the appearance of a concept. And when that concept changes from negative to affirmative, the appearance changes from unpleasant to satisfactory. Good. Correct any of these things because I may be, I don't always say things the way I intend to. Yes, we, Betty. Uh, my understanding, we're not changing from um, the horizontal. We're changing from the concept, which is on the horizontal, to the vertical. Exactly. <laughs> so we're not changing. You're not exchanging uh, uh, no. state for state. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So but glad you made that right. emphasis because we. I mean, the I'm recognizing myself as principle, for example. Yeah. Okay. If I'm recognizing myself in my function as principle, I'm all of them all at once, but yeah. if I'm recognizing myself in this function as principle, then its features yeah. are going to be brought into play and they're going to function. Yeah. So it's a little bit, it almost sounded like a, another word game. Yeah. No, no, word games, as, as I say, we might just as well have a trash compactor and take care of it all. Um, something else that I thought of that I thought might help the perplexity that was brought up this morning about the crucifixion coming first. When you realize that it did come first in every one of us, that God Almighty, the consciousness of being, crucified itself on this cross the minute you leapt in your mother's womb. So that's already done. That's already been done. Where it occurs in scripture, in the pages, doesn't matter. And where it occurs relating to the things leading to it and following it, as we will be having the rest of this week, you will uh, you'll see is not material. The, func the uh, important factor is that crucifixion, is necessary in order that I, that I live. Except I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, to being this, I shall arise again, and thou with me. That's the whole story. If the kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it brings forth much wheat. Yeah. Freedom, uh, getting back to those four <coughs> molds, of interpreting and the seven aspects, mm. it seems to me that you have to behave as if in order to produce a confirmation. And let me illustrate it this way. Years ago, the uh, Liberace, who made quite a name for himself, not only as a flashy entertainer, but as a very good pianist, wanted to play in the Hollywood Bowl. Well, no one was going to engage an unknown piano player to play in the Hollywood Bowl for some 25,000 people. And he tried to sell tickets on the basis of no name. But he had this desire to the point where he rented the bowl. And he moved the piano out on that stage. And he went out there and he played that concert as though the seats were filled with people. And later he actually did play mm -hmm. the Surely. So he behaved as if in order to produce the confirmation. That's absolutely true. And that's what we're going to get at. In, uh, if not tomorrow night, it falls on Thursday. No, it, it's, uh, it's tomorrow. And uh, we, we'll go into why we do that. It's perfectly necessary at a stage. You, uh, if you can't just turn on a button and get the feeling of being something and then have that an immediate conviction, then you, you prime the pump. There's nothing creative in doing that, but it aids, it aids. The cre There's only one creativity, and that is having a conviction of actually being it. But any means that aid me in getting that conviction of actually being it are perfectly legitimate. Yes. I have a question. I don't think I've quite got fully worded, so I may stumble a little bit. That's all right. Okay. I have been stumbling all evening. Join the company. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm in, talking in reference to the remark you made. I think it was straight out of the scripture that says, 
carnally minded yeah. is the negative and spiritual minded is the positive. Okay, now, I for one, in, in my experience, for instance, I don't drink anymore, I don't smoke anymore, I don't do a lot of things that if I choose to pick up, you do it once it's a habit. You know, it's a problem, mm -hmm. it's something that ties me down. But I am not one who can dismiss the uh, indescribable sweetness of, say, something as human orgasm or uh, the various ex exhilarations that are attainable in terms of being consciously aware of them mm -hmm. occurring. Mm -hmm. okay, I'm unable to say that the body is vital. Okay, you're the one that uh, right. I, no, basically rescued that from St. Paul, <coughs> Paul speaking of it as this vile body is. Yes. Okay. Um, I am at a loss as to where to comfortably position my growing understanding of, of this area. Of I think it's exactly what we quoted from Blake, how this is going to come to pass. He said, it will come to pass by an improvement of sensual enjoyment. That's, that All right. I don't know how I could say it anywhere near as well as Blake would. He says, when he does, when the cherub has left the tree of life, left his guard at the tree of life, the whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy, whereas it now appears finite and corrupt. That is, when I'm seeing it as it truly is, I will no longer have a finite sense of it, I will no longer have a corrupt sense of it. It isn't that way now. It's just that my sense of it makes it appear that way. So then, the life we live, St. Paul says, the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of Christ. The uh, living of it, if done with the understanding of joy, you, you find that also in Scripture, in Jesus' own words, about there's nothing unclean, but thinking makes it so. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've mixed that up with Shakespeare, who says, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. It's quite true. The, the act of itself is not, the act of itself is not bad. When I'm speaking of that, I'm talking about living. I'm not talking about the act of murder or the act of any of these things. The act of becoming a total uh, addict to something that keeps me from my freedom, that must be improved. In other words, I must not keep it at that level. I must improve. I must find my freedom from the, from the uh, addiction, which you've done, as you told me. Well, well, that's all right. And I'm saying, on we go. We do the same all the way. Not that we drop it off. The city lieth four square. You're not going to put the physical out there and say, no more of this for me. <laughs> you know, Neville used to say that. You know, when he first got off into the metaphysical realm, he wouldn't eat the closest thing. When he went home to Barbados, he was a string bean. That was the, uh, before he really began teaching. And his mother tried to get him to eat. Well, he wouldn't let her fix him anything to eat that was that been anywhere near it. An egg once a week was a terrible concession for him. He had to eat this, only this, only the pure, the pure, the pure. And it was the same with everything. And his old mentor, Abdullah, said, Neville, you are so good, you're good for nothing. <laughs> it was quite true. He was chopping off. And he soon learned, I can remember dining with him at a friend's house, and he said to his hostess, oh, how marvelous, he said, you, you realize that I have a palate. <laughs> Some would uh, try thinking, this holy man, you've got to feed him wheat germ and yogurt, nothing but. I like those things, but I, as you can see, I <laughs> eat a lot but. So an improvement of sensual enjoyment, we reduce the gluttony, we reduce the addictions, we reduce these by living the life of spirit. When we're living this life of spirit, we are lessening the hold that other things have. But we're not cutting off, as you say, the sweetness of life, of living. You're not denying that it is, but you're improving the quality of it. Does that come anywhere near what you're... I guess it does. It's just that some things by their nature have their 
appeal yes. in question of orders. Well, to and some, and to others, it's other things. One and man's nightmares, another man's daydream. Yeah, oh, it, oh, that's oh. it, exactly. All right, so and so you. try not to judge yours by what others may feel to be unsavory. As Neville used, pardon me for keep quoting him, but I can scarcely avoid it. He said, God is not some great bookkeeper up there, keeping track on how you're doing it. <laughs> yeah, God is not some great bookkeeper. Oh. Exactly. If someone else regards it as unsavory, there's nothing unsavory but in the regard of it as such. That's what makes it appear that way. Yes, Ross. Could you repeat uh, uh, about Blake as uh, the final words for finite and corrupt? What was the first part? Um, it's in the marriage of heaven and hell. And he says... Um, Or as it now appears, here we are. He says, the cherub will, with his flaming sword, is hereby commanded to leave his guard at Tree of Life. And when he does, here's where you want it, isn't it? The whole creation will be consumed and appear infinite and holy. Whereas it now appears finite and corrupt. <coughs> Now, I'll do that as slowly as you like so you can write it. The whole creation will be consumed. And appear infinite and holy. Whereas it now appears finite and corrupt. But when it's, when that finite concept has been consumed, you see, its purity and holiness is going to be revealed. It's going to stand there clear to our perception because I've cleansed the doors of perception. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, with this gentleman, I, I have to go over to see if I have it clear in my mind about addictions or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so not using learning to down these things by living the life of spirit. That exactly. Saying? You live the life of spirit and you will find less and less the naggings. Not the f attempt to live as the ascetic that can't bear to be brought near. Oh. The eyes are too pure to behold iniquity. <laughs> Well, it's true. God is of too pure eyes to behold iniquity. He doesn't see it as iniquitous. Yes? Isn't part of the reason for that because the hunger, which was expressed on a physical level for want of... You're, you're hungry. You it's, it. That's right. never satisfied. No. And you try with the senses in any form to appease or satisfy it. It never does, so it creates more of the same hunger. More of the same. And suddenly when you're no longer hungry because you're being spiritually fed, you don't have those compulsions on a physical level anymore. Not the same. No, not, no, never the same. Never. So that's an improvement as we go. And it seems to me far more sensible. Can I check on a quick question? Oh, please do. That I think I might have made. You said spirit, liver, soul, lungs. Right? Mm -hmm. spirit, what? Said? You, said, you said that spirit is liver and purifies. Yes. And the soul is the... The lungs would be... Right, that's where you find them. Because you, you breathe. You have inspired. Inspiration is a feature of soul. That's their function. And the sensory capacity of the nervous system would be applied with... The whole nervous system is principle. That's yeah. muscles, bones. Yeah, the whole framework of, of nerves, where it's a network, the network, communication, the network. 
As I say, these are only aids. It isn't, a, it isn't that you press a button like a computer. You press and say, oh, look, I've got gizzard trouble, and I'm going to punch this. And I'm going to... <laughs> that isn't the way it's done. It's just an aid, because that is where it more logically relates. Intelligence would seem a more logical relation to mind than it would to uh, uh, principle, exactly. Because principle, while it is the, it's the same being that, it, that mind is, it's another facet, which helps to understand the infinitude, the limitlessness of this which is. That's where you start, and if you do, and start living in balance, uh, consciously so, you may find you have been all along. But it will certainly reveal to you what's been malfunctioning. As I say, any malfunction appears to the understander. And then when you understand who you truly are, and live that in expression, that living, because it's outgoing, is going to cleanse the uh, malfunction going to set it on the right track. Now, I'm glad you brought that because it seems to me that there's a connotation there of casting around and saying, now let's see, what, was, what did I do that was wrong that brought this on? Or, I can tell what she's been doing. <laughs> it's very hypocritical, really, when you come right down to it, to look around and say, because someone's limping, oh, I can see what... I happen to know a little about her on the side, and I know what's halting her progress. Very superior. Well, that would be because then, uh, that wouldn't be right, because no. uh, life gives us all kinds of challenges to sure. see what we're going to make of it. Exactly. It isn't like a punishment. Never. Oh, thank God you said it. <laughs> Wonderful. It is not there as a punishment. It's a challenge to awaken myself. Who is it that's playing the part? If I can restrain the judgment, because I think it's so obvious what brought on that malfunction in someone, if I can restrain that judgment and see that it is my very being which is playing all the parts, and if I can't see that that's a dramatized state, that means I haven't yet played it, and I've got it yet to wake from. If I can see that that's not a person who has got it, that's a dramatized state of thus and so, that shows I've already awakened from it. I don't then ever have to put it on and wear it. That Egyptian, the Egyptian is dead on the seashore and I shall see him again no more. Yes. Uh, Freedom Neville said that we will not awaken until we are baptized in the body of love. Would you care to comment on that? I didn't, uh, of course, hear that uh, uh, very phrase, and so it would be awfully hard for me to do. I believe that what he's saying there is the same thing as Blake said about he who waits to be perfect before entering the Savior's body, the Savior's kingdom, will never enter there. You're baptized in the body of love when you understand the wholeness, the totality of your being, since that's the seventh day when there's nothing more to do. Then when you are so immersed, in that totality, you are in the Savior's kingdom. But I, what was the first of it that we don't, we don't, what did he say? We don't. He said we will not awaken uh, until we, not, we are baptized. We will not awaken until we're baptized in the body of love. Well, uh, I don't want to get tangled with his words because, as I say, I didn't hear them. I missed many opportunities. When he sent me to San Francisco, I said, what am I going to do? I can't hear you every Monday and Thursday at the Wilshire Eva. <laughs> so if I fell short of what he intended, it's his own fault. He wouldn't give me a minute. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't give you a mailing list. He gave me a mailing list, but he wouldn't give me a second's instruction. He laughed in my face. He said, you... I can't, he said, I can't give you a nickel. 
and you don't know anybody in that city, but I have a list, and you may use it to send notices. And if you can't do it, you can't do it. I know you can. He said, my vision has never lied to me. I'd, if I had that same kind of conviction that he had, it would have been wonderful, you know. <laughs> well, really, I've never had any Messiah complex. I don't say that Neville had a Messiah complex because he had the experience of being God Almighty. He knew it from the start. I had it under, uh, theoretically. I had this thing because he sent me and because I, he sent me because I understood the principle. But as far as uh, having that conviction that I was sent to do it by the on high, the on high in me never sent me to do it. I was quaking in my boots. <laughs> oh, I was. Somebody said something. I wish I could have heard it clearly. It sounded great. <laughs> now, uh, what you have to have to make a success of it, I can see. Uh, many are called, but few are chosen. Neville asked Aldous Huxley what that meant. And Huxley said, why, I, what he asked him was, why are so few chosen? He said, so few will choose themselves. So few will choose themselves. I never would have. Now that I can see choosing the self of me, the self of me chooses to be the self of me. This is, this is great. But he gave to each according to his talents. He gave some to be preachers, some teachers, some... Whatever they were, they were... You'll find it in Ephesians. Uh, the whole purpose was to the edification of the body of Christ. So you accept whatever your talent is, and you exercise it, you do it, to the best of your ability. And the result is, you and all that constitutes your world are baptized into the body of Christ. So we shouldn't <coughs> resist the uh, gifts we were given. If you have a capacity to communicate, you should communicate. I was greatly castigated for not coming to the city of San Francisco as frequently as I did and just do this all the time. Well, I had this opportunity at the castle where I was dealing with the world daily, a cross-section of the world daily, and my product to purvey was 3,500 years of the creations of men's hands which represented their religious beliefs. And so I simply used that as my springboard to do what I was doing in the city. Only, instead of reaching 50 people a month, I was reaching several hundred a day. And there was no name, there was no label on it, but there was never a tour that left my direction that didn't have some spark ignited. And they had it. And it's been bearing fruit ever since. So I'm not sorry I did it, but when Vern asked me if I'm going to make this my life's, my life's work now, I've, uh, it's hard to say. My plan is not to do it this way necessarily, but I do want, I have got tons and tons and tons and reams of notes, which I would like to make into readable material so that it would be constituting some reference that one could return to. So when you asked if I would do a monthly letter, I don't know that I would grind them out by the month, but I would say whenever they come, by way of inspiration, I'd like to do that. Are you still working on past I haven't done a thing about that since the last thing I gave in San Francisco nine years ago, because I have been working 10 hours a day at something else. However, uh, I still have the research is all done. It's just a matter now. The entire introduction is done and the epilogue is done. So everything's done but the book. <laughs> everything's done but the body. <laughs> That's right, I've got the bookends. Now something to go between. What? I'm Alpha and Omega, but I haven't yet 
prove that I'm all that goes between. <laughs> Good. Yes. What was that? Vitality, which is one that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't use that often. And this morning, after being, you know, leaving here, and, and by the time I got home, it was quite late. And so this morning, when the alarm went off to get up to class this morning, my first impression was, oh, I wanted to turn it off and go back to sleep. And, uh, but I really didn't want to do that. I felt that, that I didn't want to do that. Yes. So I remember, remember the word. You are wonderfully and disciplined. I am vitality. Well, what I, what I was going to say almost interrupted you in the beginning when you said that a, for a new word, vitality, and I thought, you don't have to have the word, you're the embodiment of vitality. You have been the, you're the quintessence of vitality as I see you. And that isn't just tonight, but since Sunday morning. No, <laughs> which is very good lesson for everyone to learn. We don't always feel all of them all at once, nor will we. And we shouldn't expect to. And we shouldn't be bludgeoning ourselves with a billy club if we don't. <laughs> How are we doing on the uh, timing there? Is it, I mean, you're not running out of... No. Okay. Oh, two hours. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> don't tell that to Jimmy. <laughs> Now, do anybody that has anything bring bring it up? Uh, yes. I believe I remember the context in which Neville made this remark. Oh, how that'll help! He said he had a spiritual experience in which he was called into the divine council, mm -hmm. and there he met a figure who was man. He said, "With well, sheer power." Yeah, I remember this. The embodiment. question, or he asked him, "What's the greatest thing in the world?" Right. And Neville said, "I replied, faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest of these is charity." Then he said, "This figure." fused with me, and we were no longer twain, but one. And at that point, he, he, he admitted that was his spiritual awakening. So then he said, we will not awaken until we are baptized in the body of love. When he told me, and I have this in his, uh, I have this in his uh, transcriptions of his Los Angeles lecture, and he said, when I fused with the embodiment of love, we were not the same as you said. He said, we were not separate entities, but one essence. And I had no sense of being anything other than what I had been. And he said, that experience would make the most intimate experience on this globe seem like being two persons in separate cells. It was such an intense experience of oneness. Yeah, he said that without questioning, he said, what is the greatest thing in the world? He said, I said, love. And then he fused with the embodiment of love. He also was fused with the embodiment of power. He said, the man would, with such power, that with one flick of an eyelash, he could have shattered the universe. So he knows what it was to be in the presence of power. And that was the one who sent his finger out like that and said, down with the blue blood. And he found himself ready to go on the platform. What do you mean by that? Down with the blue bloods, the established opinions, the old sense of values, the <laughs> we the better. Well, the daughters were definitely upper class. Oh, they were the they were the they were Bridgetown. Not in the beginning, not in the beginning. If you read in um, The Power of Awareness, where he gives a lot of case histories, read that one about the, the family that lost the business, and one of them, instead of seeing the name such and such, Moth, LL Moth, one member of the family saw B.G. Lodard, well, it was the Goddards that had lost the business, that had nothing. And Neville, with his understanding, superimposed his, as, as Vern was saying, you have to get the feeling of being this. So he put that sign, and in his mind's eye, he saw the Goddard family name. Well, the Goddard family name not only went on that, but all of Bridgetown. 
And they literally, his brother Victor was the purchaser of the food for the islands, not just that island. They had what was called food fair. Probably still have, I don't know. Because then that was when they were part of the uh, United Kingdom. Now they're a, an independent nation. Perhaps. Let's go into that. Is there? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. All right. Uh, to be spiritually minded is to be real minded. If I have the spiritual sense of something, I have the real sense, the sense as it truly is, which cannot ever be riffled through with holes. It cannot be drowned. It cannot be disintegrated. The spiritual is. The carnal appears. And because it's mortal, because it's literal, because it's subject to uh, dissolution and decay, it shouldn't be prized too highly. Yeah, that's certainly clarifying. That's, I, mean, I, I was previously looking at carnal and had flesh. Yeah. I was looking at it from the transitory language. Right. Do we, they... we put our power to the definition rather than Well, there's the... I'm at, at loss to personally orchestrate this. Well, good, I'm glad. You see, you have to reach the place of being personally impotent, personally incapable of, of uh, operating it, orchestrating it. I love that term. It's so much better. It has a tone. Uh, when you become personally incapable of doing it, you will be spiritually embodying it as done. And that'll give you the means to uh, do it on the, what will appear as the literal level. But it will be appearing there, not originating there. You won't be energizing it from there, because you'll wear yourself out. But if you can spiritually embody it as done, you will see that. In fact, uh, remember Dan, when we were discussing a certain thing about whether or not we should uh, you as a family should take uh, overt steps about something, a situation that we would have been advised to do. And we discussed it and came to a great relief that to do it spiritually and see it as done would not be ignoring the problem at all, but it would be avoiding the manipulation and getting your fingers caught in the cogs and not only damaging your fingers, but upsetting the machinery. Um, maybe just, I could put in from here, like, for instance, if you take alcohol, yeah. any other obvious mind level, you cease the, the partaking of it. That doesn't automatically guarantee sobriety. No, not at all. Sobriety is something that happens as, an, as the result of, but it's not one plus one equals two. You don't stop drinking and get sober. No. As I understand sobriety. Uh, that's my sense of it, too. Yeah. It isn't something that you know, one personally does merely because they quit the abuse of something. They don't automatically entitled to the benefits of it until the awareness grows from, I guess, the new soil. And what the new experience is, is giving is, you know, uh, And this is the one who said that he might not say it rightly? <laughs> Great. Sure but you, but it was, it was very, very clear to me, and I'm sure they got it as clear. Very clear. Okay, we've gone over by. He says we have two hours, so it's all right. We'll see you tomorrow night, which is Wednesday, and that's going to be the fulcrum of the Holy Week. Oh, sure. Thank so, you.
fine. Love it.